Today on the Emmanuel Pulpit. And still today, some believers make compromising decisions with little, if any, thought as to how it's going to impact future generations. One danger of an altar named Ed is that it looks so good now that it blinds you to the problems it represents for the future. With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, here's the Emmanuel Pulpit and Pastor Mike Stone. This is the only time in our Sunday night series through the book of Joshua that we have backed up and uh, looked at a second sermon from the same passage of Scripture. We were in Joshua 22 last week as we are continuing our Sunday evening series, Walking in Victory. We've been trying to learn some lessons in triumphant Christian living from the book of Joshua. And our study brings us back to a familiar uh, text. Uh, We were here last week in Joshua chapter 22. Now, before I introduce tonight's specific message, I want to remind you of a couple of things related to the land of Canaan. The book of Joshua is a story of Canaan's conquerors. It's the people of God possessing the land of promise. And in each of these sermons, I have reminded you that Canaan is not a picture of heaven. Canaan is not a picture of what God wants to do for us in the sweet by and by. Canaan is a picture of what God wants to do in us, with us, through us, and for us while we're living on this side of the door of death. In other words, Canaan is a picture of what God wants to do with and through His people in this life right now. For that reason, we've noted that Canaan is not a picture of heaven. Canaan is a picture of victory. And you will never walk in victory in this life if you do not learn the lessons that are laid out for us in the book of Joshua, specifically those that are in this 22nd chapter. Now, last week we learned a lesson about the danger of conflict. When Joshua 22 opens, everything is well, but something happens that takes the nation of Israel to the brink of civil war. If you were here last Lord's Day uh, on Sunday night, you note that what happened was the construction of an altar. The conflict involved an issue of worship. It was a religious dispute between believers. In other words, they were ancient Baptists. Did, Did you hear about the Baptist church where they had a little controversy in the business meeting one night? The deacons felt like The sanctuary had just gotten dated. It just needed a facelift. It looked like it was just too old. And so they decided they were just going to do a makeover inside the sanctuary. And they they said, what we need to do is uh, buy a new chandelier. And one man rose to speak against it. He was always against everything, so nobody was surprised. He said, I'm against buying a chandelier for three reasons. Number one, the church has existed for 74 years without it. Secondly, $500 is too much to pay. And thirdly, nobody in the church even knows how to play the thing. I'm against buying a chandelier. Last Sunday night, we looked in this chapter about the danger of conflict. There's also a story that, God willing, we may look at at some point in the future about the danger of complacency. The two and a half tribes, commonly called the Transjordanian tribes because their land allotment was not within Canaan proper. They lived east of the Jordan, across the Jordan, so we call them Transjordanian tribes. These two and a half tribes are willing to settle in, settle down, and settle for less than God's very best. But tonight, I want us to revisit this story, not to look at the danger of conflict or complacency, but the danger of compromise. These Transjordanian tribes are not guilty of the idolatrous motive of which they are accused by the other nine and a half tribes, but neither are they totally innocent of the terrible sin of compromise. They're willing to live just as close as they possibly can to be considered the people of God, close enough to be called the people of God inside the kingdom, but as close to the edge of obedience as possible. The Holman commentary points out that while these two and a half tribes had every right to settle in the land east of the Jordan, this chapter, it says, reintroduces the nagging question as to whether or not that was God's will. Let me say that again because it's very important. They are not necessarily living outside the borders or the boundaries of God's promised land 
because the original promise given to the ancient fathers extended all the way to the Euphrates River and was not necessarily bounded by the Jordan River. So the Holman commentary is right that we, we cannot say that what they did was completely wrong, but it was not exactly wise. The construction of this altar is symbolic of a danger that would lay ahead for these two and a half tribes. Its height, its beauty, its majesty, and the fact that it was apparently constructed with good intentions did not immunize these Transjordanian tribes from being deceived. Tonight from Joshua 22, we revisit this story in a message I've called The Deception of an altar named Ed. Joshua 22, we're going to begin our reading in verse 10. If you're able and willing, would you stand to your feet to honor the reading of God's Word? I'm reading tonight from the King James translation of the Bible for a reason I think will become apparent. Uh, when chapter 22 opens, the land has rest, all of the tribes have received their land allotment, and Joshua blesses these two and a half tribes and sends them off across the Jordan to their land east of the river. The Bible says in Joshua 22 and verse 10, And when they came unto the borders of Jordan, that are in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh, built there an altar by Jordan, a great altar to see to. And the children of Israel heard say, Behold, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built an altar over against the land of Canaan in the borders of Jordan at the passage of the children of Israel. And when the children of Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered themselves together at Shiloh to go up to war against them. And in verses 13 through nearly the end of the chapter, we read last week about how uh, an envoy from the tribes inside the Jordan came and confronted them about the construction of this altar, and they gave a reason saying basically they had been misunderstood. They said, we did not build this altar as a rival altar for the altar in the tabernacle at Shiloh. No, we built this altar because we're concerned about our children and our grandchildren. We fear that one day this Jordan River will be seen as a boundary and that your grandchildren will say to our grandchildren that they're not welcome at the tabernacle at Shiloh, that we have no part, no lot among the people of God. We're afraid that if we did not build this altar here, it would be bad for the generations to come. And then we come to verse 34. And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad called the altar Ed. Now, modern translations translate that word to the word witness. Verse 34, the children of Reuben and Gad called the altar Ed, for it shall be a witness between us that the Lord is God. Father, would you bless the reading of your word, open our hearts, our minds, and our ears to receive what you would say to us tonight. And I pray, Lord, for myself, for my family. I pray for my children. I pray for my grandchildren yet to be born. And I pray the same for every family, every household that is represented here tonight. That we would not be deceived by religious activity. That we would not be hoodwinked by spiritual sounding jargon and activity. But God, that we would give to you our unmitigated, undiluted allegiance. That we would obey you with every ounce of our soul, every fiber of our being. May tonight our cry be that we want to walk in absolute, total, unrivaled obedience to your word. And we ask you to do it for our good and the glory of Jesus, in whose name I pray. Amen. Be seated, please. In the early 1960s, there was a sitcom on CBS. The show revolved around a klutzy architect by the name of Wilbur Post and the ongoing conversations that he had with a talking horse. The Palomino was played by an actual horse named Bamboo Harvester. But the horse's TV name was Mr. Ed. Now, I'm too young to remember Mr. Ed, but Robbie Metlitz told me about him. (laughs) 
In Joshua chapter 22, we have a non-human object that wishes to talk to us tonight. But it's not a talking animal. It's a talking altar. And the altar named Ed wishes to speak tonight. And if you and I will listen, I believe he gives a threefold clarion call. Three strong words of caution and warning. There are at least three problems we need to identify with this altar named Ed. Now, I know what you might be saying even at the outset of the message. Brother Mike, I'm here tonight. It's Sunday night. I'm here building an altar. Yes, but it might be a deceptive altar named Ed. Now, in order to avoid being deceived by this altar, I want you to notice three things about it. First of all, an altar named Ed looks sacrificial, but it has no life upon it. When the tribes come from inside the Jordan and they begin to confront these two and a half tribes, they say, you've built an altar as a rival altar. You've built it in direct competition with the true altar in the tabernacle at Shiloh. And their answer is quite telling and frankly it is staggering in verses 26 through 29 let's go back and read it again therefore we said here's their explanation their justification for the altar they said let us now prepare to build us an altar not for burnt offering nor for sacrifice but that it may be a witness between us and you and our generations after us that we might do the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings with our sacrifices and with our peace offerings that your children may not say to our children in time to come, ye have no part in the Lord. Therefore said we that it shall be when they should say to us to our, or to our generations in time to come that we may say again, behold, the pattern of the altar of the Lord. In other words, we've just made a copy here of the one at Shiloh, the, the pattern of the altar of the Lord which our fathers made, not for burnt offerings nor for sacrifices, but it is a witness between us and you. God forbid that we should rebel against the Lord and turn, from this, turn this day from following the Lord to build an altar for burnt offerings, for meat offerings, or for sacrifices beside the altar of the Lord our God that is before His tabernacle. The reason I say their answer is staggering is because they just admit right up front, we just build it for looks. This altar was never intended to have anything sacrificed upon it. This altar named Ed is just for the exterior. It's not for actual worship. It was intended to be looked at, not intended to be worshipped before. Its purpose was just to be seen and never used. Like the man who buys himself a new Bible but hasn't used the old one that he's already got. This altar named Ed is just for show. There's a warning here for the people of God. You can have a 70-pound Bible, wear a three-piece suit, and have a car that's held together with Christian bumper stickers, but if you won't sacrifice to serve Jesus, it's just a dead altar. You can quote from the Bible. You can put Christian memes on your Facebook page. You can wear a Christian T-shirt that has a picture of a cross that says Jesus beat up the devil with a big ugly stick. But if your Christianity doesn't cost you something in this sin-cursed world, it's as worthless as tickets to watch the Atlanta Falcons try to win a Super Bowl. You can shout to the pastor. You can clap to the music. You can own all the Bill Gaither homecoming DVDs and know all of them by their first name. But if your Christianity takes a path of least resistance, your faith is not worth a hoot up a hollow log. One commentator commenting on this text says, It's a shame that their excuse for building the altar is that it's not intended to be a working altar. Too many Christians' faith is kind of like the set of fine china in your mother, your grandmother, or your wife's china cabinet. It looks really impressive when company comes over, but it's hardly, if ever, used. The problem with this altar named Ed is it looks good from a distance. But nothing is ever intended to be sacrificed on this altar. 
You see, the altar of God was to be a picture of the Lord Jesus. That altar that was at the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, presently located at Shiloh, it was intended to be a picture of Jesus Christ. The high priest on the day of atonement would offer the sacrifice of the Paschal Lamb. The blood would be shed. The life would be taken and the picture of mercy would be painted. It was a type of the coming promised Messiah, the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. And listen to me, brothers and sisters. You cannot paint a picture like that unless you're drawing it in the dark red hue of the blood of sacrifice. This altar is a picture of a belief that as long as you're in the kingdom, as long as you're in the family, as long as you're within the right borders, you don't have to live a life of sacrifice. That's the religion of modern-day Christianity. I'll come when it's easy. I'll serve when it's convenient. I'll give when I've got extra. Brother Andrew, I'll sing if I like the song. I'll go if the building looks cool. I'll attend if my kids think it's six flags over Jesus. I'll pray if there's nothing better to do. I'll work if there's something in it for me. And I've come tonight to say this altar named Ed which will wreak havoc among the people of God in the generations to come, will give us a stark warning tonight. Your life may look sacrificial, but if it is not saturated in the atoning sacrificial work of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is absolutely worthless. May God give us tonight the spirit of King David, who after he had sinfully and rebelliously numbered the people of his army. And God sent a plague. David knew that he needed to build an altar. He needed to make a a sacrifice to his God. And do you remember what happened in 2 Samuel chapter 24 and verse 24? The man who owned the place where the altar would be built saw his king coming and said, Oh, king, what are you doing? He said, I I, I need some cattle, and I need to buy some land, and I need to buy some wood because I'm going to offer a sacrifice to God. And the man said, In essence, you're my king. Here, you can have it for free. And he said, essentially, God forbid that I should offer to my God that which costs me nothing. One of the most sacrificial things that you can do in service to Jesus is to be willing to serve Him when it's not easy, when the road is hard, when the conflict is great, when the opposition is mounting up against you, when it's something your flesh does not want to do, when it's something your preferences don't want to say amen to, but you know that you've got a commandment from the Lord God of heaven and earth, and you say, whatever it costs me after what Jesus has done for me, there's no price too high, there's no gift too great, there's no service that's too difficult. I'm going to give my best to my God. But now if you're not careful... You'll just settle for an altar named Ed. Looks good, but no blood of sacrifice will ever be spilled upon it. An altar named Ed is deceptive because it looks sacrificial, but it has no life upon it. An altar named Ed is deceptive, secondly, because it looks spiritual, but it has no longing within it. Now, as we read This chapter last week, one thing that makes it difficult to interpret and why many Bible students even view it differently. You you could stack up commentators on either side as to whether or not this altar named witness or this altar named Ed is a good thing or a troublesome thing. One thing that makes it so difficult to interpret is these Transjordanian tribes, if they're anything, they are very sincere. They're telling the truth when they say, we did not desire to rebel in our hearts. They were sincere. Do you remember that little poem? Poor little Jimmy, he is no more. What he thought was H2O was H2SO4. The ones that are chuckling, those were the ones that paid attention in chemistry. What he thought was water was sulfuric acid. And so poor little Jimmy, he is no more. It's a reminder that you can be sincere and be sincerely wrong. And they were. When these tribes came to the edge of the Jordan River, 
According to their own testimony, here's what they said. In generations to come, this Jordan River is going to be a boundary between us and the rest of our family. It's going to be a barrier between us and being obedient to our God to bring sacrifices to the tabernacle at the appointed time. I submit to every parent and grandparent in the building tonight that when they saw that where they were heading to live would have the great and probable potential to create spiritual trouble for their descendants, bells should have been going off in their heads not to determine what are some small things that we could do to try to keep the inevitable from happening, but rather what can we do to get our grandchildren on a different path of inevitability? Why not make a different decision? Rather than spending time trying to avoid the dangers ahead, why did they not just simply get on a different road? And I have these same questions posed to me. People who within their question acknowledge there's danger on the road that we've taken. But pastor, do do you have some lucky charm dust that you can sprinkle over this dumb decision we've made for our family? Pastor, my son is 14 going on his first solo date to the school homecoming dance. I realize the danger. Do you have a good Bible study that he could do? Pastor, we've joined a travel ball team and we're going to be gone three weekends a month. We realize the inherent danger in that. So do you have a good devotional family guide that we could go through together? And by the way, Brother Scotty, do you think some of the youth might call him at least once a week? Because we're afraid that if he lays out of church three weeks a month that he might start drifting away from the things of God and grow cold in his walk with Jesus. Folks, I'm not making this up. Pastor, I'm working out of town four nights a week with this hot-looking female co-worker. You think one of the deacons might be my accountability partner and call me about every week and a half? Yeah, I'll call you, I'll call you dumb. <laughs> I've got a better idea. Why don't you get a longing in your heart to stay as close and as clean as possible? Why don't you get down in your soul a desire to not put yourself in dumb, compromising situations and thinking that some spiritual rabbit's foot like an altar named Ed is going to protect you. Again, turning to the Holman commentary, the writer says, The choice land east of the Jordan River was legitimate and legal and very much a part of the land God intended to give to Israel. Whether it was a smart choice to live so close to the pagan peoples and to be the first to take the crushing blows of Assyria and Babylonia is an entirely different question. One of the dangers of living outside the Jordan was that you're living outside the Jordan. You see, the Jordan was, among other things, a very formidable river at various times of the years, especially during flood stage. That meant that during a day where armies marched and where adversaries moved to a large degree by foot, if you were living inside the Jordan River, you were more protected, you were more safe. And even when the armies would come, as they eventually did come, at least you had a heads up, you had some time to prepare. There was a warning about coming attacks. Just think from your own history books. Whether it's the Continental Army crossing the Delaware or the Allied forces crossing the English Channel, waterways have always been a natural military barrier by choosing to live where they're living. They've placed themselves further from the tabernacle and closer to the enemy danger. Warren Wearsby calls it being a borderline believer. Now why in the world did they do that and why have I said this altar represents something that looks spiritual but there's no longing within it? It's because of why these two and a half tribes wanted to live east of the Jordan to start with. 
You don't have to turn there now, but trust me, or go back and study it at a later time, but jot down a reference to Numbers chapter 32. As part of the wilderness wanderings, these two and a half tribes come to this land that is east of the Jordan River, and they come to Moses and say, in essence, we'd like to just settle down here. As for our potential allotment across the Jordan inside the land of Canaan, we don't want any of that. And the reason is, listen carefully, we've got a lot of livestock. We're in the livestock business, and the grass here is green. We'd like permission to settle down on this side of the Jordan. And Moses is incensed. Again, perhaps impugning their motive and jumping to a conclusion, he thinks they just don't want to go across the Jordan and fight off all the Canaanites. And so he says to them a strong word of rebuke, and they say, oh, no, that's not what we mean at all. Listen, we'll leave our wives and our children here, and we'll cross the Jordan with the other tribes to make sure that all of the Canaanites are defeated And we won't come back to our wives and our children until after the land is at peace. Now Moses was satisfied with that. There's indication the Lord may have called upon them to do that. But in my estimation, and you may disagree, they put their wives and their children in danger before. They cross the Jordan and they do hand-to-hand combat for the better part of seven years. And the whole time they've left their wives and their children across the Jordan right on the edge of danger. And they are doing it because we want that land where it will be a great place to raise livestock. I believe they put their wives and their children in danger before, and they're putting their grandsons and their great-grandsons in danger now. As for these Transjordanians, their kids and grandkids will be the last ones to the tabernacle and the first ones taken in battle. Some years ago in spring revival that I was preaching in another state, I preached a message on Sunday night about the importance of Hitching your family to the things of God. The importance of raising your children and having your family around the things of God. And to my great shock and personal embarrassment, a man came out the handshaking line. Remember, this is Sunday night. And he took the host pastor, his pastor, by the hand. And he didn't say this to me, but I was standing right there next to the pastor. He said, Pastor, we won't see you tomorrow night. We will see you Tuesday night. Well, we might see you tomorrow night. You see, preacher, it's like this. The the boy has a t-ball game, and it's forecast for a little bit of rain. If it rains tomorrow night, the game will be canceled and we'll be here. But if it doesn't rain, we'll see you Tuesday night. Now, I was embarrassed for my pastor friend. Besides that, it wasn't my place to rebuke that church member. But I'm telling you, in that moment, what I wanted to say is don't waste your time. We'll need your seat. Because you have just stood in the very house of God and said to the man of God that the one you claim is your Lord is no higher than second place behind a rained out t-ball game. Now, if you don't have a longing to serve the Lord, build any altar that you want to. It won't matter. This altar named Ed, the commitment to come Tuesday night, will deceive you. And it will deceive you because an altar named Ed looks sacrificial, but it has no life upon it. It looks spiritual, but it has no longing within it. And the third deception perhaps the most devastating it looks spectacular but this altar named Ed has no legacy beyond it they have no idea no foresight 
No discernment for how this borderline living is going to come back to haunt their descendants. It is ironic to me that they say they're doing this for the sake of their children and grandchildren and for the sake of unity. And yet the decision to live here will have dire consequences on the generations to come. And as far as promoting unity, commentator John Davis in his commentary on Joshua points out that the construction of this altar was the first in a series of transjordanian actions that later led to the fragmentation of the entire nation and still today some believers make compromising decisions with little if any thought as to how it's going to impact future generations there are times as a pastor from my vantage point as your pastor, that I want to say to members of this church, are you blind? Have you no idea where that road is going to lead? I use a lot of driving illustrations in my counseling ministry in particular. So could I just say, if you, if you make your way over to I-16 at Dublin and you get on I-16 west, you're going to end up in Macon. If you turn south out of this parking lot onto 121, you're going to end up in Hoboken. And if you keep going, you'll find yourself even further. That's where that road leads. I'm praying for God-given discernment. First, for myself as a dad and as a pastor and as a man of God and as a husband, that God would give me a divine ability to see in small decisions where that road will lead. And far too many believers have no discernment. And they make a decision that looks real spectacular, sounds great at the time, but it's as dumb as dumb could possibly be. Would you like an example? Thank you, I'll give you one. I've seen this in our own congregation in times past. You let your kids decide where to go to church based primarily on the feel the style, the atmosphere, or where their 13-year-old girlfriend goes. The Greek word for that is idiotos. <laughs> you say, well, they're still in church. That looks spectacular. But you've just built an altar named Ed. Neither you nor they have lived long enough to see the ramifications of that spiritually dumb decision. Note this statement on the screen. One danger of an altar named Ed is that it looks so good now that it blinds you to the problems it represents for the future. Guys, I don't know how it is around your house, but I have have banished HGTV from our uh, channel. That's Hell's Garden Television. (laughs) But one of the things that happens when you watch HTV, a lot of those shows are these kind of ambush makeover things. You know, your wife, she goes to the grocery store for two and a half hours and comes back and everything's different. Listen, and everything looks great, including the glossy trim that they just painted over with a simple paintbrush. And if you don't know it or not, that's not the right way to do that. And it's going to look speckled and spotted, and it's going to start peeling, and it's going to look awful. What I'm saying is it looks great now. But you need to have enough sense to know that if we do it that way, it's not going to last. Let's put in a little more work now. Let's do it the right way so that it will be something built to last. Beloved, the devil's work is never easier than when he has convinced us that our actions have no long-term consequences. I think of Lot pitching his tent towards Sodom with no way possible to see the long-term consequences of living that close to the world. As he moves his tent around, he's just building an altar named Ed. Doesn't have enough sense to foresee the death of his wife, the destruction of his home, and the debauchery of his daughters. And then, as for these two and a half tribes, they've actually got the nerve to blame God 
Did you see it in verse 25? Look at it again. For the Lord hath made Jordan a border between us and you. Newsflash, Emmanuel. God did not make them live there. God allowed them to live there. Don't ever think that God approves of everything God allows. Just because he has not chained you down to a hitching post somewhere does not mean that God approves of the life we're living or the decisions that we're making. God didn't drag Lot down to Sodom. God didn't drag Samson off to Delilah's barbershop. God didn't force David into a bed with Bathsheba. God didn't drag the prodigal son off to the pig pen. And God has not forced you to live on the outside borders of obedience just as close to the edge of sin as you could possibly, possibly be. What are the dangers of this altar named Ed? Well, it looks sacrificial, but it doesn't cost you anything and there's no life on it. It looks spiritual. Everything looks great from a distance. But there's no deep longing within the soul. It may look spectacular right now. But the reality is you won't live long enough. You can't live long enough to see the ramifications of unwise spiritual decisions on your children and your grandchildren. Years ago, I received a call from a man. He told me that he had lost everything. He'd lost his family, lost his profession, lost his income, lost his house, lost everything. And when I asked him how, how'd you lose all that? He said slowly. Like a frog being cooked alive in water that is being slowly heated, the slow nature of the demise is part of the deception. Don't be deceived by an altar named Ed. Don't live a Christian life that's easy and carefree and costs you nothing. Don't settle to live outside the very center of the will of God for your life and settling for less than God's very best. And don't forget that today's decisions will have long-range effects. I close with this thought. Sit still and listen very carefully. Don't be self-deceived by religious talk and spiritual activity. Don't be deceived by an altar named Ed. You've been listening to the Emmanuel Pulpit, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Mike Stone, Senior Pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church in Blackshear, Georgia. With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, Pastor Mike is committed to walking you verse by verse through books of the Bible. We pray this message has been an encouragement to you as you seek to learn and live the Word of God. Free audio downloads of this message, as well as general contact information, are available through our website, ebchurch.net. Thanks for joining us for today's message from the Emmanuel Pulpit.